And as Marvin said, today we'll pull together some of the threads that uh, we've uh, unplucked uh, over the last, uh, well, actually it's, it's almost a year. Um, by way of introduction, uh, this is my canned uh, uh, background, you know, petroleum engineer or petrophysicist. Uh, I, I answer to both. Um, all of these dates are actually a year out of date, so add another one to, to those. So a couple of years with SolarSense, uh, three years, four years since retired from BP. Um, yeah. And, and always worked in mature fields, preferred mature fields. Never got excited about the exploration stuff. Um, got far more interested in uh, extracting this, the uh, hydrocarbons efficient, efficiently from, uh, from the ground and making sure the wells were in a, a healthy, happy and fit state. Hence why the uh, cased hole and displacement recovery and, the, uh, and laterally uh, the fibre optic type uh, activities. Uh, and that's actually quite an old photograph now, so I think I've aged a little bit since then. Um, and the usual caveat about, uh, yeah, this is a live demo, so if there are any glitches uh, with uh, Microsoft patches or flaky internet connections, or uh, I'm doing this from my uh, uh, COVID uh, home and uh, this is my dining room table and so if there's any family noises going on in the background uh, you'll you'll have to excuse those that's the the uh, times that we live in um the as uh, marvin said we we did a, a four prior webinars the first one uh, that was the 4th of December, actually, uh, last year. We just introduced different components of a fibre system and we, we tried to go through how flexible it is to deploy fibre these days, that you've got a lot of choice in terms of deployment mechanisms. There's lots of choice in terms of the interrogation units and acquisition boxes. And then finally, the interpretation and processing. There's, there's quite a few things that... Um, are available in the market now. Um, so the e example that uh, we're going to go through and have used in the past, uh, all of this data was acquired on uh, Slickline. So this was uh, fibre enabled Slickline uh, run off a conventional uh, Slickline uh, unit with conventional Slickline crew and uh, uh, pressure control equipment. So it makes it uh, very simple, easy and flexible to use. Um, there was a memory sensor package at the end of the, uh, the fiber where the operator uh, ran a gamma CCL pressure and temperature gauge uh, to, to give them uh, that additional information. And the way this particular survey was acquired, uh, we ran into the bottom of the well and uh, it was, did a baseline survey for an hour or so before starting to manipulate the well. Uh, the problem with the well was uh, a communication between the tubing and annulus, A annulus, and uh, they, they needed to uh, fix that before they could uh, restore production back to the well. Uh, and it was actually costing them about 2,000 barrels a day of deferred production. So it's not, not an insignificant amount uh, for them. Uh, so that's by, by way of uh, you know, background in terms of the examples that we'll see today, because I, I keep forgetting that uh, you know, if you've just dipped into this particular webinar, you, you won't have the context of the previous ones. And so I, I, I do need to explain a little bit and set, to set the scene. Uh, the, the second webinar that we did uh, was in February and that was fiber versus wireline. Uh, and that's simply, uh, are compare and contrast against the two um, measurement uh, types. And it's not that wireline uh, is better or worse than fiber or vice versa. They, they, are, they actually have uh, unique uh, things that uh, each bring to the table. And it's 
true to say that if we ran a fiber, a distributed fiber survey in a well, it gives us a really good overall view of what's going on in that well prior to any targeted uh, uh, sensor package uh, at the, the bottom of the string. And, and so it's almost like a pre-survey uh, where I can stand back, look at the well as a whole, uh, manipulate the well at the surface and induce, deliberately induce changes, and then use that information to have a very targeted, precise, uh, now that may be in the same run in the well or uh, a subsequent run where we, we can run a, a much more sophisticated uh, acoustic package or uh, you know some of these point uh, measuring tools etc and know what we're looking for and how we should set that up so it makes uh, the whole gathering of data uh, a lot more efficient in terms of uh, you know, a targeted response and knowing and what will work and what won't work with uh, a deal of confidence the, the third uh, webinar we did in April was on distributed temperature data uh, and uh, we went through how that uh, data can be acquired and imported and the, the myriad of different views that we can use to look at uh, how the data is presented so to try and tease out as much detail as possible uh, from that information. Uh, and then the, the last one that we did was June uh, of this year on DAS data, which is the one that uh, people worry about in terms of the data volumes. And we went through how uh, the hot DAS application can be used to uh, decimate the data, uh, do the frequency extraction and shrink it down to uh, something that is much more manageable in size for for shipping around to uh, different decision makers or, or to uh, the higher end interpretation uh, folks uh, who are maybe not at the at the well site so um, each one of those were little discrete uh, data elements and uh, pieces of the puzzle uh, and so what i wanted to do uh, now was to start pulling those uh, things together and uh, you're know, saying okay here's what we're getting uh, from each of these different elements and how we we pull them together so um what i want to do now is to uh, move on to the uh sort of come out of this yeah there we go and then move on into a quick view uh, which is the application that we use for um displaying uh, the the data uh, so here, what I've done is uh, I've taken the, the same data sets that the, from the same well that we uh, had in the previous webinars, and uh, I'm just displaying, I'm rendering these things, uh, I've got these pre-built pre uh, uh, views just to A, save a little bit of time, and B, save a little bit of acreage, because uh, I'm doing this on a, on a lap, laptop. But um, we, we talked about how we can introduce uh, engineering data so uh, your know, uh, casing points or completion elements and so again uh, you know here we've got some sidebar commandos gauges packers safety valves and hangers uh, and we can add to that uh, however we wish and then likewise uh, we've got the other static elements of the the, the casing shoes um, and then uh, there's some geological information to formation tops. Um, all of this can be uh, set up before uh, we move out to the rig site. So there's no reason why uh, we couldn't have all of this information already uh, prepped and, and loaded up uh, you know, as we go to the well site, before we go to the well site. And so as the data comes in, whether it's memory data, DTS or DAS data, uh, we're just uh, laying that alongside uh, this other information that we already know about the well. Now, the same can be said about uh, open hole data. So we've got the ability to pull in log data if we wish. And so again, there's no reason why I couldn't load up uh, a reference gamma ray, for instance, if that's the primary depth reference or a prior log 
from some historic uh, run in the well, or even the open hole data, the uh, either the calculated curves, then the prostate permeability saturation type uh, information, or uh, the open hole data, the density neutron uh, gamma uh, from from the open hole logs. Uh, all of it, uh, I, I'm I'm quite a strong advocate of. Uh, we, we run a fiber survey, and the information that that's uh, that's telling us is being impacted by uh, quite a number of different things. Uh, certainly, the completion and the uh, and the casing, but also things like uh, the cement uh, and the formation. And so, if I've got more information uh, at my disposal, when I come to look at and interpret these images that we're generating from DTS and from DAS, then uh, I can make more sense of it if it's all in one package and I'm, and I'm just you know, you looking at it from, a, from different angles. So this particular data set, uh, these are the static elements that uh, uh, we've uh, gleaned. Uh, we, we ran a memory gamma CCL pressure temperature. And so this is one uh, particular run uh, from, I don't, can't remember if it's a run in hole. Uh, actually, it's, yeah, yeah, it's probably the run in hole data. Um, where we can see there's clearly on the pressure data a liquid interface in the tubing. And we've got a thermal profile uh, that we can uh, look at. Uh, the gamma ray data itself, uh, there's some gamma spikes on there that uh, uh, may warrant uh, further attention. I mean, it's, uh, again, it's quite common that uh, we would have uh, at points of either fluid entry or, or exit from the well if we're looking for leaks, uh, then we may see uh, uh, some increased gamma activity as radioactive salts are deposited. Um, so not necessarily scale, although we have seen on these fiber surveys some very uh, active scaling, radioactive scaling uh, show up as well. So it, we've got this uh, static data uh, and memory data loaded up in this particular view. Um, and you know, there's, there's nothing that uh, particularly jumps out. There's maybe a little bit of, uh, and that might be associated with the side pocket mandrel, that particular gamma spike. And there's a few other spikes here that, uh, that we might need to pay attention to. Um, as usual with the with this particular application, the functionality is there to uh, zoom in and zoom out to give us a better view on uh, stuff and more detail. So, so that's my uh, static uh, data and my memory data. Uh, the distributed temperature data uh, here's uh, the distributed temperature data that we've acquired. And again, uh, we've seen that, uh, you know, that this particular well does have some interesting features, but to orientate ourselves uh, in terms of uh, different events, uh, what we can do is we can say, well, when did certain things happen uh, in, in the well? So in this particular column, the, the DTS column. Uh, I want to add in so just some time references so uh, I know roughly what's going on. And so at uh, this point here, the uh, uh, fact, let's just move this uh, down to the bottom. Uh, yeah, th at this point here, that's when they started to uh, line up to vent the A annulus. So there was pressure on the A annulus. And so that's when they started the, the vent process. And uh, it was a gradual uh, opening up of, of the annulus. So it took a little while for it to get going. Uh, and then uh, we see this activity. Uh, and that's quite a nice partition between uh, a baseline uh, on the left and on the right when the, we, the vent process started, started up. And then this other line here is when they uh, stopped the vent process uh, and started to uh, close it in again. And, and again, there's a bit of a lag uh, between when the annulus was closed and when we start to see things decaying away. Um, but 
So certainly with, with this type of temperature uh, view, uh, we definitely get the impression that there's something happening at the bottom side pocket mandrel. And there's also a feature moving up the way with time in the well, uh, originating down uh, close towards that side pocket mandrel. Uh, and then further up, we've got quite an area of activity uh, uh, above uh, in the upper half of, of, of the well in terms of temperature. So when we look at that in the context of the casing, completion and formations, we know there's permeable intervals uh, in roughly this mid part of the well. Uh, we've got some casing shoes and so clearly above that 13 and 3 eighths inch casing shoe there's, uh, there's activity going on. Uh, and then likewise, uh, round about a safety valve level um, or you know, some of these more recent set sediments, there's, uh, there's uh, activity. Um, the reason why we've got this big red uh, carpet at the top is because they're venting the annulus. Uh, what was uh, a nice cold four degrees C uh, seawater uh, has uh, warmed up uh, just simply by the movement of fluids uh, up uh, through the, the, the water column. That's why this just gets washed out and shows us red. Um, and then just as a, a reminder, uh, we've got the ability to very quickly flip between one view and the other. This is the, uh, the uh, relative difference plot from a, a nominated baseline. But if you wanted to have a look at the absolute data, um, let me move this out of the way, that, that's what it looks like. So yeah, in, in absolute terms, there's not a huge difference uh, here. So if you just looked at the raw data, you wouldn't see anything in that, uh, that data set. But when you start looking at relative difference, it really starts to uh, jump out. Uh, and then another view would be a successive time difference between each individual uh, temperature increment and you get uh, you know, a lot more uh, clarity in terms of some of these features that are popping out uh, uh, here and up in the upper uh, overburden. So it, it's, it's really nice uh, being able to uh, take the static data, show it alongside uh, that particular uh, view. Uh, and then again, we can do exactly the same sort of a, a thing with the DAS data. Uh, and so here's the DAS data over a, a shorter time period, uh, I hasten to add, because uh, there's a heck of a lot of uh, detail on the, on the DAS. Um, and again, we can see a lot of features going on in this well. Um, on that uh, note, uh, what I've done is I've copied the, the, the DAS data into this same data set here. Uh, just so that you've got a, a better view of the, the wider picture. And again, I'm doing this just to save acreage on my laptop. If I had a, a dual monitor, I'd be able to have this on one screen and the, the rest on another. But so we've got one, two, three discrete data sets uh, where we've closed off the file, started a new file, just so that it's in manageable uh, chunks. Um, uh, and that, again, that's for convenience. We. We see this uh, feature moving up up the well, and this is quite uh, quite a distinct feature. Uh, and then it tails off a little bit, um, and then we get this big red wedge uh, of uh, of data uh, here. Uh, you have high amplitude uh, at a at a specific frequency, um, and what that turns out to be is if you if you recall the static data we had a fluid interface in the tubing which is was at about this sort of level and when we started the annular bleed then uh, we pulled uh, fluids into that annular space and uh, increased the liquid level in the annulus and uh, there was a only a slight reduction in the tubing uh, side 
uh, fluid interface. And so what we're seeing is that thickness there, that distance there, is the level that the liquid in the annular space has reached, even though the uh, the tubing side is where the, the, the slick line has been deployed. Uh, and so there's a, a difference in the acoustic properties of uh, down at this deeper sort of level where both tubing and annulus contain uh, liquid. And then here we've got uh, an increasing liquid level in the annulus. And then uh, up at this sort of level, both annulus and, and tubing have, have uh, gas. Uh, gas in them. Uh, and so that's the, the change that we're seeing. Um, and and we, we wondered about this effect uh, when we first acquired the data. But uh, what you have to remember is that we've got a downhole gauge on the end of the fiber uh, that is giving us pressure. And we also had a, a note during the job of the tubing and annular pressures, and we knew the fluid gradients uh, involved. And you know, the, these depths tie in exactly with uh, what you would see on the hydrostatic uh, change in the liquid levels in the annulus. And so effectively what that gives us is uh, an annular volume that uh, over the duration of that survey that that liquid has uh, moved up and uh, an effective leak rate uh, through uh, that uh, side pocket mandrel uh, into that annular space. So that was kind of nice to, uh, to that those elements all uh, tied in uh, quite nicely together. So uh, to move back to the composite images, so 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 here we've got our uh, different data forms now. So I want to display all this in, in a single frame, a single page. Um, so here's my uh, temperature data, here's my acoustic data, I've got my completion elements in this column, my uh, formation data here, and my gamma CCL. Um, I'll squish this up a little bit because it's not of particular interest. Uh, give more acreage to this stuff. So here uh, we've surmised that, that that feature there is actually caused by the uh, increase in the liquid level and the annulus. So what we want to do is to say, well, uh, let's take a gradient of that and uh, see see what sort of rates we get. And so that's uh, yeah, kicking in at uh, 0.12 uh, meters per second uh, increase in liquid level uh, for, for that particular feature, um, which uh, I mean, again, that tied, uh, that tied in with the uh, hydrostatic changes that we saw in the well. Uh, and so let's do the same with my uh, DTS data. Uh, so the, the time scales are slightly different uh, on these two plots because it's, uh, and there we go. So both of these uh, things, um, if you remember the reason why I flipped to the other uh, data set is because we actually have one, two, three different panels of, of data uh, because it's such a, a, a large amount of uh, DTS uh, or DAS data here have fitted the whole lot into a single plot. But both of them are, are showing the same uh, slope and so I'm quite happy that the DTS data matches with the DAS data, which matches with the pressure data from hydrostatics and they're all saying the same thing. Um, so I'm quite happy that yes, we are indeed seeing a liquid level uh, increase in the uh, annular space and that it's uh, coming from the uh, mandrel 2 depth, that's the the ultimate origin of it. Uh, and so I, again, I'll, I'll add in uh, you know, a depth event uh, here. So side pocket mandrel leak. This, this is when the, 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 the time they actually started to line up uh, the annulus to, to, to vent it. But uh, again, when they're venting, it takes them a little uh, while to line everything up and then crack open the valves uh, fairly slowly to start with and then at ever increasing rates uh, but then it takes a little while for the temperature to respond 
to that. And you can see a similar effect here on the, uh, the uh, DAS data as well. So I'm quite happy that that was the actual source of the problem. And indeed, uh, the, the operator opted to uh, take, uh, or to swap out that uh, lower SIPO command valve and uh, repressure tested uh, the annulus held pressure and uh, then restore the well back to production. So, so really the, the primary reason for going in uh, was achieved. So we identified the source of the leak, uh, it was fixable and they, they fixed it uh, during the same uh, rig up in the well. Uh, all of this data was Uh, uh, quick enough to allow that to happen during the same rig up. So, so the operator was uh, fairly happy with that. Um, so that was the main reason why we were in the well. But uh, clearly there's other stuff going on that uh, was not expected. So if we uh, move further up and zoom in a little bit, uh, yeah. So here, uh, I'm going to just move it and get a bit more sp space. Uh, so th there is activity uh, going on. Uh, you're just above this uh, 13 and 3 8 inch shoe uh, or at, roughly at the shoe level uh, with these changes in formation. And we can see that on both the acoustics and the, the temperature. And then likewise, uh, there's a, a, a geological boundary between more recent uh, soft sediments and uh, this other formation. And, and again, we're, we're seeing activity uh, there. Um, and that wasn't expected. Uh, we can, again, the other feature that we've got with this DAS data is that this is one uh, rendering of uh, one frequency band at a specific temporal and spatial resolution, but we can cycle through all of the, all of that data uh, to uh, look at different views of the same uh, data set to try and tease out uh, more more information and get a, a clarified view. So this is at quite uh, much higher frequencies. Um, so we're about uh, one, one to five uh, kilohertz on this. So, you know, there is clearly uh, energy being generated and activity going on in this upper portion, which uh, again, that wasn't recognized. And uh, should the operator wish to either work the well over, sidetrack it or abandon it, then this is all really useful information for them uh, to uh, uh, help program uh, the abandonment of, of the well. And it certainly gives them a heads up on uh, potential pores and permeable beds and communication between intervals uh, within, the, within the well. So uh, quite a nice uh, data set uh, to, to play with. Um, the, the other thing, if we zoom in to, towards the base of the, uh, of the well here, if, we, if I blow this up a, a little bit, uh, clearly we can see uh, that the origin of the fluid movements is, is, is from the, the formation. And so we've got a certain slope uh, but that's the slope of that line changes uh, as we get to the side pocket mandrel depth. And so uh, the slope of this, in fact, let me just add in uh, a couple of little uh, more uh, gradient lines. So the slope of that is quite different uh, to the slope of that. Uh, and that's simply because uh, there, there is, uh, we're constraining all the fluids within the tubing at uh, up to the side pocket mandrel depth. And so it's moving up at uh, about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 meters a second. But then we've got leakage through uh, the side pocket mandrel into the annular space. And so any uh, bubbles or perturbations in, in are, are uh, slowing down in the tubing side. Um, as it migrates from the tubing to the annulus side and then starts to feed this 
gross liquid column moving up in the annular space. Uh, the, the fluids were sitting at bubble point pressure. So as soon as we started to bleed the annulus, then we started to evolve uh, 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 associated gas from the, for, from the oil. Uh, so that gives us some quite nice uh, little uh, uh, signals as the uh, two-phase fluids start to move, uh, move up the well. So, so that's uh, quite a, a quick uh, run through uh, this particular uh, data set. Um, the, the key point here is uh, I, I want to be in a position to be able to look at DAS and DTS data sets on the same page in conjunction with any uh, open all data, if I've got the open all data or in conjunction with uh, any uh, formation tops and completion elements or casing uh, elements uh, so that I can start to make sense of some of these features that we're seeing in relation to either the formation, the cement, the uh, casing or the completion. Um, we Remember that we're deliberately trying to induce flow in these wells and so we always have this baseline period where we uh, see what normal looks like. And this uh, DAS data set, it's, it's this first little uh, little portion that's the uh, the, the, ba the, the baseline. There, there is another file with uh, you know lots more of it, but it's quite quite dull. There's nothing nothing much going on. But then, as soon as you've lined up the well to uh, to start uh, bleeding off then uh, you know, there's a bit of a, a period where they, they crack open the, the annular valve uh, a little bit and you can see that here and then they, uh, they gradually open up uh, more fully and then we really start things moving uh, a little bit further on in, in time. But it's nice to see all of the elements uh, coming together uh, well and all creating a coherent uh, story about what's wrong with the well and how we could fix it. Um, and as usual with all of these uh, fiber uh, type jobs, uh, you always get more information than, than uh, you would have thought, uh, than you would bargain for. There's always a, something extra in there that we didn't know about. Uh, and that, that's very true in this well with this upper, uh, these upper features uh, that are going on. Um, and that's true in both the, uh, uh, the acoustic data and also in the uh, temperature data. So there's clearly uh, things happening uh, in the upper portion of this well that uh, the operator wasn't aware of. So um, I think uh, I'd kind of like to leave it at that. I mean, the, the one regret I have in this well is uh, I would really have liked to have had some uh, cement bond data or cement mapping uh, data that we could have pulled in and uh, shown alongside this because then that would have been a really nice uh, story about uh, what's happening in terms of the presence and quality of cement uh, behind pipe. Uh, but uh, that, that wasn't available to us. But uh, yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't uh, include that in a... Yeah, you know, if it was available. So, uh, you know, a really nice story. Um, so, when we come to the, uh, the 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 punchline for for this particular well, the uh, the primary fault was identified as the faulty valve, and it was uh, replaced, and the well was successfully restored to production. Uh, you know, two thousand barrels a day ish. Um, and then there were additional issues identified in the upper porous and permeable beds uh, in the overburden um, that uh, you know, that certainly provided the operator with valuable insights into future uh, well abandonment uh, issues. So that's really uh, the, the main things that came out of this particular uh, study. Um, but there are, there's a quite a lot more detail uh, in there in terms of uh, the uh, annular uh, hydrostatics and uh, how you can work the, 
that out that again uh, adds a bit more uh, texture and colour to the whole the whole story, um, and then also some of these other uh, features uh, you can track down uh, what the, what they are as well. But uh, alas, that's uh, a fairly lengthy uh, uh, explanation, more than a, a forty minute uh, discussion will 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 involve. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just uh, just just to mention briefly uh, with. Uh, to, to that to everyone regarding you know a question we had earlier which was uh, you know how long did it take you to generate that conclusion that you're showing here particularly around the the psychic pocket mandrel leak uh, so could you, you know, I mean could you just walk through how you know the data was was acquired how quickly it was interpreted and yeah yeah <laughs> Yes, uh, I do have my uh, the, the the scars on my back uh, from 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 that one, uh, and it's mainly around the uh, the, the uh, as usual. Uh, by the time they actually got onto the well and rigged up, it, it was uh, well. In fact, you can see from here it was about six o'clock in the more uh, in the evening, and then by the time they rigged up and uh, the, the the various pipe work to uh, start the bleed process, it was closer to about nine o'clock at night, uh, and then uh, the survey went on until about three in the morning. Uh, so you know, here we're just showing from up to two in the morning. And so at half past two in the morning, um, the data was ready uh, for for transmission. And so literally I, I had from then until 7.30 in the morning uh, to uh, get a coherent story together for the morning meeting. And, and so this was offshore in the North Sea um, and the the data clearly this the DAS data had to be frequency extracted and and again one of the advantages of taking it in manageable chunks is that you can have a, a laptop uh, extracting the frequency transforms while you're still acquiring using the interrogation unit and so uh, as one file was closed off it went into the uh, processing as the the frequency extraction process while they were recording a, a fresh file and you only ever lost a, a few seconds or a few minutes of data um, but uh, it just means that it's more efficient in terms of speed of turnaround so yeah I probably had uh, four or five hours uh, to turn this around to a, a coherent story for the for the client um, and uh, well, I'm, I'm 61, so at 61, uh, getting up at uh, half past two in the morning and uh, you know being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for 7:30 was was a bit of a challenge. But hey. <laughs> okay, there was uh, thanks, Mike. So there's a question that came through. It's not actually posted in the Q and A. So if you do have a question, there's a bottom called Q and A. You can just drop the question there. But in the chat, uh, Jose has, um, has said events seen on the D DAS DTS analysis could be, could be identified with wireline PLT measurements, any particular complementary data obtained with fiber in this particular case. Uh, I think you've mentioned some of that, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think this is where... Uh, yeah, the, the, the complementary data, so the data that we acquired with, with wireline was the, the memory uh, data, so the gamma CCL pressure temperature. Um, the, you could argue that, well, you know, would we have achieved the same thing if we'd run a, a production log, uh, a PLT, for instance, and you could say, well, actually, you, you might have got the same sort of thing, but uh, you would have had to have... Uh, you've been bleeding off and uh, running the survey at the time and uh, you've, you've no visibility in terms of what's happening over the, the whole well. That This is why if you, if you think about the second webinar, the one in February, which, which is fiber versus wireline, the advantage here is uh, I could have whatever sensor package I choose at the bottom of the, the slick line. I could have had a much more sophisticated 
uh, acoustic device, for instance, like uh, I mean, GoWell's got uh, the uh, uh, Ant tool that the, that uh, is or Alpha tool, is it? I forget, uh, Marvin. Uh, which one is it? Yeah, is noise, it tool. Noise, tool. noise tool. Yeah. Yeah, the noise tool. Yeah. So w with that, if if there's something of interest then rather than have that tool run over the entire well, uh, I, I can have a very directed thing. So for instance, this looks like a really interesting uh, feature here. And so there's no reason why you couldn't, if you had a, 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 a noise tool at the bottom, uh, sort of pull up and then uh, over that short interval, do a much more sophisticated, detailed, targeted uh, survey to find out what was going on there. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't think about, oh, I can do it all with uh, wire. These, these things are all uh, interlinked and uh, I really like the idea of using fibre as a broad brush survey uh, within that well and then use the point sensors uh, to give me a much more uh, surgical targeted uh, uh, view on what's actually going on in, in that well. But you know, I'm much more informed if I've got this sort of a uh, view to say, okay, here's what I think is, is happening. Now, in this case, it was, it was clear that they got all the information they, they, they wanted from that one survey. Um, but if it was ambiguous, then you, or if it wasn't clear, then you could potentially run another, uh, a much more targeted survey at very specific points in the well to, uh, to absolutely nail it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, I mean, in this case, obviously there's some uh, fluid flow from below in the well, in the yeah. site moving and out through the SPM. Uh, that's seen in hindsight before you went in, uh, you don't know. So in this case, yeah. with the flick line unit, the PLT would be memory. You wouldn't get anything until you've completely finished the baseline surveys up and down and you moved on to some bleed offs and that up and down. Um, you know, it's uh, in hindsight, yes, um, the cypolphic manual was leaking, but it could easily have been a casing leak and the PLT wouldn't have seen any of that at all. So, yeah, uh, and, and I, I kind of like the notion of uh, the simplicity of Slickline with the pressure control kit being a lot simpler and the winch being quite, uh, quite simple. Well, definitely. I mean, it, it would be more expensive to run an E-Line unit out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Slickline. Yeah. So, so there's a, in particularly these offshore jobs, a Slickline would be a much more compelling cost yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, that have come in. Um, if, if you do have any other questions, uh, let us know. Um, there is an email that you, the, in the reminder email that you would have received, uh, you can always uh, flip a reply back to us if you'd like. Uh, you know, to, if, you, if you come up with a question or you have any more information you would like to, uh, to know about fiber, I mean, we're interested also to hear, um, you know, is there, you know, is there some more um, of interest around this? Uh, uh, you know, currently our plan is this was the last in our webinar series, but if, uh, if there's some more uh, topics we'd like to cover, then let, you know, certainly let us know in, a, in the email. Um, if there's no more questions, then thanks, Mike. Appreciate the, everyone's attention today and uh, um, have a rest of the good day.